I pointed out in my last video in this series that the West is not a clear concept we can make a lot of clear statements about. It's broad, it's poorly defined, except by symbols, and what it is has always been changing. And in large part, that change comes from its contrast with the other. That's been different people at different times, but now more than ever, the so-called West contrasts itself with the so-called Muslim world. When we assume that divide and all the differences that supposedly constitute that divide, we create the West and the Muslim world. Without that discourse, these things don't exist. So we'd better look at the discourse. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. So, the Muslim world. Where is it? You could make the case it's the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or the OIC, which is an intergovernmental organization with 57 member states around the world. Does that make it official? Is that what everyone means when they say the term? Does it mean only Muslim-majority countries? If so, does that include Nigeria, which is kind of half-Muslim and half-Christian? plus, of course, other local religions. Lebanon, Syria, Palestine? Are they even Muslim majority? I hear all these places lumped together as Muslim countries, as if they're the same in all kinds of ways other than religion. Or like that the religion is so powerful it makes everybody there act the same. And surely the Muslim world includes religious minorities like Christians and Jews in places like Egypt, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Iran. Do they get treated the same everywhere? Often you'll find when the rulers of those places find it in their interest to divert attention from themselves, they find a way to stir up anger against Christians and, of course, Jews and other minorities living in the, um, how many countries did you say we're talking about? Anyway, violence against minorities to distract from what the ruling class is doing? That's the same everywhere, including whatever country you're in. Another thing they might do in those places that we're talking about, that we think we're talking about, is make a couple of laws in the name of religion. But they do that everywhere, too. Like I said in my video on the state, most states nowadays are pretty similar. They all pretty much serve the owners of capital, just mostly different ones, and they're all structured pretty similarly. The state doesn't necessarily reflect the culture just because it made some laws probably is a kind of distraction to pretend that's what really matters and to give people something to debate about, when what really matters is these people have a monopoly on the creation and enforcement of laws that they pass over us for their own benefit. And they do that everywhere, too. We have common interests with people in all those places that we're talking about, far more than we do with politicians and the rich in the same country. Anyway, the reason that we need to ask all these questions is to acknowledge what a wide variety of people we're talking about. Yet a lot of the people who talk confidently about the Islamic world or whatever wouldn't know where to begin to answer these questions. You know about the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? You know how the less you know about something, the more confident you are when you talk about it. Anyway, like I said in my last video, we're talking about concepts that defy definition and only exist to the extent they exist in our words. The OIC makes it official, and our words the Muslim world, etc., make it simple. 
How many different cultures are we talking about? How do they differ? It doesn't really make sense to talk about Muslim culture. And even within cultures, you can find vigorous debate about religion. Every word in those religious texts has been interpreted and reinterpreted countless times since they were written. There's very little Muslims everywhere or Muslim-majority countries all have in common in cultural terms as distinct from religious beliefs. And so maybe we, we were talking about Muslim belief and practice, but even that varies with time and place. Like, is there a cohesive Muslim world because a lot of people in a bunch of countries turn to Mecca and pray five times a day? That's why people who stereotype about Muslims don't know what they're talking about and are probably arguing in bad faith. People who don't know anything about Muslims like to assume that everything Muslims do is because of their religion. There are a couple of reasons for that. Mostly it's quite normal in an us-versus-them situation that they are one big scary mass. In the 1950s, Americans heard about the Chinese hordes. They were the barbarians, you know, who kicked the imperialists out of China and Korea. So they were the faceless mass of, of foreign people that it was okay to hate now. Now, Muslims are the barbarians. So everything they do that we don't like is opposed to our very civilization. That's the kind of bullshit rhetoric that made these right-wing political parties and right-wing YouTube channels take off. Our civilization is under threat. They don't need to literally call people barbarians for the same reason they don't need to mention skin color. It's implied. So because people think Muslims can't think for themselves and they're all the same, they believe it when they hear that every single act of violence by Muslims anywhere get called an act of Islamic terrorism, violence committed in the name of Islam. Even, even it's inevitable, as if just reading the Quran turns people into suicide bombers. They presumably think foreign occupation has nothing to do with it since most people don't talk about those things together when in reality foreign occupation has everything to do with suicide bombing i won't go into all the details now so i'll leave a link in the description to the studies that have shown nearly every suicide bombing has been a tactic to rid the the bombers homeland of a foreign occupier and even other people who are called terrorists, they usually have similar reasons. But we never hear what the person's reasons are. Remember what I said in my first video in this series on civilization? The enemies of civilization are barbarians, and barbarians can't speak. The news, Hollywood, right-wing media, plus anyone who's stereotyping them, that's where our picture of them comes from. The fact is, Muslims are not beholden to one single idea, like robots programmed to obey one master. Along with religion, you've got nationalism, a powerful idea everywhere, including among Muslims. Democracy is popular. Freedom and justice are quite popular, too. Oh, and they're individuals. So, you know, they have their own knowledge, their own experience, their own opinions that come from those, just like you. And Muslims are smart enough, by the way, to know when they're living under a foreign-backed dictatorship. How long would the Egyptian government have been able to put down the revolution without the billions of dollars in military aid that they get every year from the U.S.? How many fewer people would the Syrian government have killed without all the assistance from Russia? Would the Saudi state even be in Yemen spreading chaos if not for the billions in weapons from the US, the UK, and Canada? 
So why would I focus on suicide bombers on the other side of the world when people much closer to home are causing them? I guess it's just a choice of where you give your attention to. If you pay attention to the crimes committed by them, you won't look so closely at us. And everything I hear about them is either wrong or based on a total double standard. Like, I've been told that Muslims would hate me because I'm an atheist. They don't. I lived in Cairo for five years, and I had thousands of adult friends and students. One of the first questions most people would ask me was what religion I was. When I said I didn't have one, they usually just laughed. The way you laugh when a child says babies are born out the belly button. And since I was the one who thought they were wrong, I was hardly in a position to feel insulted and rejected. They still liked me, they still wanted to be my friend. And contrary to another popular right-wing trope, none of them even tried to convert me except for a close friend, and he stopped when he realized I wasn't interested. I've been told those must not be real Muslims, because real Muslims want to kill and convert you. Remember, barbarians don't have a voice, remember? People with a superficial understanding of a religion think they can tell people dedicated to that religion what they're supposed to think and how they're supposed to act. It's actually pretty funny that way. Right-wingers are a steady source of unintentional comedy. Now, that's not to say that no atheists have it bad among Muslims. If I had been a local, they might have acted differently toward me. I don't want to downplay the real problems of being an atheist or leaving Islam in some places, including Egypt. But that's a different problem that doesn't affect me, that, that people in those societies are dealing with. And it doesn't help for someone like me to tell a billion Muslims how they should think and what they should do. I'd rather tackle the bigger issue of bigotry in my own backyard that supports imperialism all over the world. I'll stand in solidarity with anyone subject to injustice, but I won't make sweeping statements about how barbaric Muslims are just because I've seen some videos and read a few parts of the Quran. The people who tell me things about the Islamic world or whatever mostly take a we don't know them, we don't want to know them approach to their adopted other. I kind of think Zap Brannigan said it best. Just so we'll know, who's the enemy? A valid question. We know nothing about their language, their history, or what they look like. But we can assume this. They stand for everything we don't stand for. Also, they told me you guys look like dorks. They look like dorks! <laughs> He's right. That's all it takes to start a war. How could you know you hate more than a billion people when you only have a superficial understanding of them. Oh, well, I guess I just answered my own question. When people have an enemy, they're rewarded by thinking they're superior. Everything we do seems much less serious and easier to excuse than what they do. That's why whenever these Muslim haters let loose, they bring up rape. If they're always talking about it, and even making shit up about Islam and Muslims, they can poison the discourse and make it look like Muslim men just have some systemic propensity to rape. They trot out statistics to prove it. But a lot of people seem unaware of how much critical thinking needs to go into reading statistics. Either way, they're trying to prove both how bad the bad guys are, and at the same time how good the good guys are by comparison. I think only ethnocentrism could possibly make someone think like that. Feminists have been talking about the rape culture in North America for decades, but I guess 
that form of systemic rape isn't so bad, as long as we stop the Muslims. One thing you might not realize is that European empires have a long history of using the threat of brown and black men raping white women and of justifying empire as, in the words of Gayatri Spivak, white men saving brown women from brown men. If you've ever heard the rhetoric about why an international coalition has to occupy Afghanistan, you may have heard this argument from benign empire. Sure, we killed some of those women, but some of the ones who survived are freer than they were. So while saving women from barbarian men seems to be the most common and obvious double standard, there are lots more. People talk about how that part of the world, and of course the vaguer you are, the more you can get away with saying. That part of the world is all dictatorship, which is both wrong, and a great way to provide support for the joke we call liberal democracy in this part of the world. Sure, it's not perfect here, and it isn't democratic or free, and no one ever likes anything the government does, but at least you don't live over there. Never mind how many people in this part of the world are too complacent and cowardly to fight their system, and people in places like Egypt and Syria and Sudan and Iran and elsewhere rise up whenever they can. There's nothing about one huge swath of the world that's conducive to democracy or dictatorship. Only someone whose perspective is divorced from all history would conclude that. The Muslim haters also say things like, Muslims throw gays off buildings because they heard about it once. If they had any gay friends, they might have heard the constant threat LGBTQI people are under their whole lives in this society or cishet women, for that matter. They don't want to show you those statistics. Those statistics might make our culture look like it has problems, too. Problems that might be of comparable magnitude to other patriarchal societies. Finally, they'll talk about murders and terrorism and never compare it to the literally millions of people murdered by the U.S., U.K., Canadian, and Allied militaries just in the past 20 years. Never mind since World War II. These Sam Harris types, it's often Sam Harris and his following, they love to say how many Muslims polled reacted favorably to suicide bombings, as if suicide bombing were the height of barbarism. How many Americans approved of going to war on Iraq? A lot. And how many thousands more has that war alone killed? And again, watch out for people who memorize statistics about their enemies because they love to take them out of context. I've heard Sam Harris say more than once a, a statistic for support of suicide bombings without mentioning that the highest figures, that he, the ones that he's quoting, came from the years the U.S. and its allies had already started bombing and occupying Afghanistan and were either about to or were in the middle of doing the same to Iraq and, at the time, and I remember this, were making threats to Syria and Libya and Iran two of which they have since invaded, by the way. And again, suicide bombing is a tactic against foreign occupation. Shit, I would support just about anything that got occupiers out of my hometown. Talk of how awful suicide bombings are without mentioning bombing from the sky kind of reminds me of the the discourse from old European empires who distinguished between legitimate and illegitimate forms of war. The bad guys, the way they fight, it's just not legitimate. It's fine to blow people up from the sky, but blow them up in suicide bombing? Barbaric. They're not participating in the universal values we invented and claim to be fighting for. 
They need to be punished and disciplined. And if they're illegitimate, they're evil and can't be negotiated with. Us, meanwhile, when we kill and torture, it doesn't reflect our true nature, which is ultimately benevolent. We're nice guys, really. However brutally some Muslim person kills someone, how is it worse than invading half a dozen countries, destroying their societies, jailing and torturing some people, and incinerating others from the air? And when you have nothing to say about a foreign policy that creates millions of refugees that you're funding, you're in no position to deny refuge to any one of those people. So why the double standard? Well, again, when people spend time talking about other groups, they're constructing their enemies and deflecting from themselves. These are two important and related processes. Constructing your enemies is about turning individuals into groups with easily identifiable characteristics. Those people are warlike. Deflecting, from, uh, deflecting attention from yourself happens simultaneously. You don't even need to say, like, we are peace-loving, because the contrast is implied in the initial statement. Those people don't appreciate freedom, the implication being that we do. And then usually when people say that, they prove how much they really believe in freedom by saying they want to restrict immigration of, of people from whole countries and religions and, and continents. It's amazing how much some people either lack self-awareness or just want to spread fear. Look at how they talk about murders and rapes by Muslims, as if violence were confined to one part of the world and could be explained by religious and cultural factors, These just, just simple things. Murder and rape by Americans and Europeans are quite common too. You don't want to look around you. But if we're always talking about how our civilization's barbarians are doing it, we can pretend what's going on in our own neighborhoods isn't such a big deal. If you saw on the news how someone's house was on fire on the other side of the country and the smoke alarm in your own kitchen starts going off, would you just turn up the TV really loud so you don't have to hear the alarm? Would you say, well, at least I'm not that guy. <laughs> He's got real problems. Wouldn't you want to put out your own fire, too? Moreover, this tunnel vision about Muslims makes war against them much easier. I've actually heard people say that whole region had it coming. What the hell does that mean? People think Muslims go around killing and raping, so killing them is good. Or it doesn't matter. And there's, there's also the excuse for liberals, we civilized people with our superior morals can transform their societies and give women rights, or again, whatever stereotype uh, we, we're doing this for. I hope the past 20 years have buried all those ridiculous beliefs, but I'm quite sure there are plenty of people out there who still believe the rhetoric. Then there's the right-wingers who will take isolated incidents, and sometimes even make shit up, and automatically link them back to the stereotypes they've created. That way they can always appear to have been proven right. See how this one school made a few minor changes suggested by Muslims? That's proof that all Muslims want to trample on every culture they go to, and this will never stop until they've destroyed us all. That's pretty much every right-wing YouTuber in a nutshell. Even though this attitude is, I think it's easy to understand, given the shape of the political discourse, it's ignorant and it's dangerous. That's not to say all talk of a Muslim world is ignorant and dangerous, 
Books like Engaging the Muslim World by Juan Cole and Who Speaks for Islam by John Esposito and Dalia Mogahed show the depth and complexity of the subject. It just needs to be understood that we're talking very generally and have no basis for stereotyping. I'm convinced most people are capable of appreciating how wide and complex a thing like a billion and a half different people is. But sometimes we're lazy. And sometimes we want to believe in something. So we just accept what some guy on the TV or YouTube says instead of spending the time and effort oof, learning about the issue for ourselves. And when our thinking gets lazy, we accept the us-them binary and the partisanship and the divisions and the stereotypes that go with it. I mentioned in part one of this series how, after 9-11, the Bush administration drew the lines between the civilized world and the world of the barbarians and told us to pick a side. They were careful, of course, in their speeches, Bush and you know, these other high-ranking high uh, government officials, not to imply that all Muslims were this or that, but that didn't stop millions of Americans and other so-called Westerners from calling the brewing conflict a clash of civilizations and saying it's pretty much because of the Muslims. It was easy for millions of scared people to jump or maybe fall into the conclusion that the whole culture over there is bad when without strict definitions, such a statement would be meaningless. There are lots of books, news sources, and other media that perpetuate these simplistic beliefs, and I think when so many people around you are nodding their heads, mm -hmm, you feel like they're all right, so I must be right. right? When in my experience, that usually means groupthink. Since 9-11, it's been easy to make people think all Muslims are the enemy. And when you believe all the lies about the Muslim world and Islamic countries and so on, you use your image of them to construct your image of your own society by contrast. In the wake of 9-11, the U.S. and U.K. governments created a divide between Muslims that labeled the Muslims they were going to be watching radical Muslims, and the ones who voted and paid their taxes and didn't hate the state, even though they should, moderate Muslims. This divide is, of course, arbitrary, and always has been. It's just the state's way of giving themselves the power to do whatever they want to people. It gave the media a simple way to tell people whom they needed to be afraid of, in this case, anyone who might be a radical Muslim. Well, how the hell are we supposed to know that? Based on appearances. That guy doesn't conform to our local standard of dress. That woman's covering her hair. Better call the police just in case. And it's pretty telling the public so gleefully glommed on to this artificial grouping of people that they didn't understand and started using the media language. Just like all these double standards, this one made it look as if so-called radicals were scarce among whites and Christians, i.e. civilized people and abundance among the people the state had designated barbarians. These messages were seized on and spread, and they've been fostering the racism and fascism that Donald Trump capitalized on when he ran for president, and continues to promote to crowds who are dying to strap on a gun and shoot up a mall. As I've said before, it's not just Muslims. Muslims are the barbarian to U.S. foreign policy. But the more we believe the barbarians from one place are a threat to us, the more scared we are, and the more susceptible to racist fear-mongering about barbarians, say, from Latin America. How many mass shootings 
committed by white supremacists will there be until people start looking at actual causes. More prejudice against Muslims inevitably leads to more prejudice against all groups of minorities, because aside from normalizing bigotry, it legitimizes the lies of the right wing. Like, like when they call their events free speech conferences or freedom defenders of America and, and hold them purely to talk shit about Muslims. Hating Muslims is a kind of wedge they can use to make people who aren't self-conscious bigots listen to more of their bullshit. It emboldens them when people don't shout them down. And it's just easier for others to think their ideas are valid if they're heard more often, or if they're seen more often. Like recently when CNN gave a platform to a known white supremacist leader named Richard Spencer. You probably know the more voters hear an electoral candidate's name and see their picture, the more they are likely to vote for that person. Well, the more you hear about people like Richard Spencer, the more he sounds like a legitimate source on something. He's not. He's a neo-Nazi piece of shit. That's the only thing we should associate him with. The same goes for a thousand more prominent voices on the right who make six figures lying or deliberately misrepresenting news stories and history books just to get us to hate on Muslims. Or to make money. They know there are millions of ignorant fish in the bowl with their mouths open waiting to be fed whatever bullshit is thrown to them. Maybe they just don't care about the people they're hurting. It has the same effect. The Muslim world is like the West, a poorly defined, poorly understood idea. Serious discourse does not use broad simplifications that imply an us versus them dichotomy. If you don't know enough about something, you don't have to have an opinion on it. Just listen and study and experience. You don't have to pick sides. Or, if you understand the situation better, you might want to side with the oppressed against their oppressors. We don't have to use other people's terms and concepts. We don't have to fall into stereotypes. Lazy thinking about broad ideas can lead to dangerous conclusions. So let's not let that happen. Hmm? Thanks, everyone. Please like this video if you liked it, and subscribe for a new perspective on the world every Saturday.